other side of the square, facing the railroad tracks, right across from the Starbucks there in the Kennesaw House building. And uh, of course, I encourage all of you to come visit us over there. But today we decided, tonight we decided to bring um, this lecture series to the uh, to the council chambers at City Hall um, for just availability of parking. And um, also just uh, a little bit closer to town, and, and I think it's worked out well for us. So thank you again for coming. Um, this program tonight is a part of our Diverse Cobb uh, series and initiatives at the museum. A couple of years ago, we decided as a staff that uh, we needed, desperately needed, to bring in more diversity to our programs and our exhibits and, uh, and the people that um, make our museum so great, the volunteers. Um, and so I created a Diverse Cobb Advisory Committee. And if any of you are here, and a number of you are here, would you please stand? Uh, 
um, not only, it's, it, we collect all of Mario's history. And in the past, it's been 90% white history. And I, I want to change that, but I can only do it with your help. I can't walk in your homes and grab your albums and scan them myself. I have to have you bring them to me. So that's one thing that we like to do for photographs. Um, and then the other half of that is artifacts. When you walk in a museum, you want to see things. You want to see things from the past. You know, clothing, uh, record players, furniture, um, business letterhead from businesses you remember from up on the square, a variety of different things. Um, and you want to, you don't come to a museum just to read a book on the wall or just to see photographs. You want to see things. And that's what we are. If you've been to our museum, you know we are chock full of things, really cool things, some things you can't ever see anymore. One of my favorite things to do when school children come in is to show them how our rotary telephone works. <laughs> um, so, you know, these kind of things. And it might just be, you know, a simple uh, telephone to some, but to others, it's got a whole story behind it of where it was, what home it, you know, who, what kind of maybe important phone call it made one day, or even just it was in the home of this family who had a great impact on Maria, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and actually, after the event tonight, when you go out, we've got a bunch of flyers up on a table, um, and one of them you'll see is, it looks like this, and it's our Artifact Ambassador um, flyer, and it gives you an idea of the types of things that we collect, um, and uh, things that I would hope that you would bring to us. Um, we take these donations with great pride and we cherish your family heirlooms um, in a way that I think most of your children and grandchildren will not. I've seen countless number of items of important things, important to our history, that get thrown away or they're just discarded, not because they don't care about them, but just because they don't know what they are or who they are. You know? And so if you bring them to a place like the museum, we can document them and they'll be safe there forever. So that's my, uh, my plea to bring some more things. I want to do, um, by the end of the year, and I've been saying this every year because I haven't been able to yet, I want to create a permanent black history exhibit in our museum. Um, one exhibit's just a start. We can, who knows, five or 10 years, we can have an entire museum. You never know. Um, but we have to have things, artifacts. All right, in, in the uh, future, our committee um, has a few initiatives that are coming up. Um, we partner with others in the community, other groups. One that we just, um, we just made a partnership with, which has been a wonderful um, thing, is our Stronger Together. For those who don't know about this group, um, they are a group of parents and teachers, professors from the college, uh, counselors, who are coming together to try to support the school children of all ages in the Cobb County school system who are currently dealing with issues of racism and bullying. And um, they have a, no a number of their own initiatives, but last week during the winter break, we hosted a three-day camp with Stronger Together um, where uh, this camp specifically was for African-American students in Cobb County to learn problem-solving skills and gain support from our community as they encounter difficult situations such as racism and bullying. And one of the things that we did was <coughs> connect them with some of, uh, and this is their term, not mine, some of the elders in our community uh, who <laughs> have been there, done that. And these were middle school and high school students who got to take about, um, gosh, at least two or three hours uh, with some of the elders in our community, Mr. Grable and his wife or some, and they got some one-on-one -on -one time, they got some sharing. It was a very, um, Jorge was there, it was a very, um, I think, beneficial to both, both generations um, event. And so we, we hope to do that again. But also on March 14th, Stronger Together will have a launch party at the museum. I'll be launching um, their website and sharing their initiatives with our community and we invite everyone. That's at March 14th at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, which will be a, a good social time and time to learn more about that important group in our community. Uh, on March 16th at 6.30, back over at the museum, we're going to have an evening event, a panel um, titled Racism Today, Perspectives in Our Community. This will be a panel discussion with members of our Diverse Cobb Advisory Committee on personal responses to and observations of racism today and throughout history. It will be moderated by Harlem activists and uh, committee member Jorge Williams. And we also hope in the future to participate more in our June
Juneteenth activities to, ho to host more black history courses for both adults and children, and of course to create that permanent exhibit. So those are just some of the things we're doing at the Marietta Museum of History, and we need all of your help, everyone. Um, even if it's just helping us spread the word. Even if you can't physically be there, just help us spread the word. So, those are some of the things coming up. <clears throat> now, let's get to tonight. Um, I am very excited about our evening tonight and um, have wanted to do this for quite some time. Um, but first, before I introduce our, our uh, special guest here, I'm going to interview or introduce our moderator, Dr. Tom Scott, who many of you here already know, I know, uh, is, has been a mentor and was a college professor of my own and helped encourage me and, and introduce me to the wonderful world of our local history, um, only, you know, years ago, <laughs> <laughs> barely out of college. Um, but Tom Scott, he joined the faculty at Kennesaw Junior College in 1968, and that year he started the Kennesaw College Oral History Project. Over the last 42 years, students and faculty members have conducted hundreds of interviews. Many of those have been of our African American citizens here in Cobb County. Um, until, you know, really we started some of our initiatives at the museum. Really, the only place documenting our local black history was Kennesaw State University, and it was all due to Dr. Tom Scott. So we can all thank him for that. Um, he has been a recipient of many awards over the years, um, but most recently he received a Governor's Award in the Humanities from Governor Perdue and the Georgia Humanities Council in 2004, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council in 2019. Tom is the author of three books, Cornerstones of Georgia History, Cobb County, Georgia, and the Origins of the Suburban South, which you can get at our museum gift shop, and Kennesaw State University, the first 50 years. He retired from KSU in 2011, but continues to work on a variety of campus and community history projects. Uh, what, he works often with us at the museum. I know you're involved in the Lemon Street um, History Documentation Project. Uh, and, and so we thank you for coming today to guide us through this interview process here. We're going to interview a very special man in our community here, Mr. James Gober. Mr. Gober was born in Marietta. He graduated from Lemon Street High School and then went on to Daniel Payne Junior College in Birmingham, Alabama. He also went to Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. He has a certificate in the HUD Administration of Insured Home Mortgage and an NAHRO Certified Public Housing Manager. He worked for the City of Marietta as the Director of the Lawrence Street Recreation Center and with the Marietta Housing Authority and owned a, a business as a general contractor and consultant. His other activities include community relations to better communities, race relations, housing and employment with people such as Aaron Cuthbert, Frank Sexton, George Miller, Johnny Banks, Walter Moon, Hugh Grogan, Hattie Wilson, Clara Jenkins, and Sarah Nichols. He was also uh, an active member of the Civil Rights Movement in 1960 with the sit-in demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama, under the leadership of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. And we will be hearing about all of these things and more, and I wish you would all please help me welcome Dr. Tom Scott and Mr. James Gilbert. Well, Mr. Gober, you don't look like it, but you're at least two or three years older than I am. And, uh, <laughs> so I think you were born about 1940, if I'm not mistaken. And, well, I got confused. You got confused? Yeah, I, I, I missed one year. Yeah. I, I think I tried to grow too fast or something like that. <laughs> what year were you born? 41. 41, okay. Uh, so you're two years, two years yeah. different. But at any rate, uh, the reason I asked that or said that is that I wonder if you'd start by talking about what life was like um, growing up in Marietta in the 1940s and 50s, and maybe talk a little bit about where you grew up and uh, uh, what the community was like and you know, how segregation worked in Marietta in those days for you. Well, back, uh, I was born, like you said, 1941, uh, a place called Baptist Child. Uh, the streets 
name at that time was Mulberry, which was Cusper Street. And they changed it to the big name now, I think, with all the homes on the $500,000 home. That's the same street that I was raised on. <laughs> and when I go down that street, it was just like it was when I was small. The houses were close, shotgun, but it was the same layout, believe it or not. And born in Marietta at that time, uh, there were two, three communities, I would say. There was Fort here, there was Louisville, and Baptist Town. And Baptist Town was a popular place because there was a lot of activities over there. Uh, Fort Hills was a sophisticated place because they had projects that had, well, they call them projects, but they had uh, <clears throat> running hot water inside, they had bathtubs, they had somebody to cut the grass, you know. We was homeowners in Baptist Town, but we didn't have inside bathroom, no hot water. <laughs> so in Baptist Town from uh, Mulberry, Hunt Street, Pine Street, as well as Weldon Avenue, it's the same, with the exception of the new homes that are on, uh, I would say, Custer Street now, and Avery Street. But back in the days, uh, there was a lot of unity uh, in the community. Uh, that unity had to do with, I think, the parents that we had. And when you come to race relation, uh, it was good because a lot of our parents and, and, and grandparents worked for the prominent white people in Marietta. They raised their children, the doctors and so forth. So, there was always a need there, but the need was based upon, you know, better education, you know. Uh, we had good houses, there wasn't really bad houses, just uh, Mulberry Street was at that time, Johnson Street. But all that had to do with, uh, had to do with the way it was when it come down to blacks and whites separately. But when I was coming up, uh, there were maybe, uh, I would say six or seven uh, families that was really poor, really poor. And we were one of those families. But we wasn't poor to the fact that our neighbors was neighbors. Whatever we wanted, we could knock on the door to get it. And even that, when we messed up, our neighbors cooked us, cooked us as well. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't that bad. But in the community also, uh, in Baptist Town, there was businesses. Charlotte Hunters, in fact, I see uh, Miss Hunter there, with your husband, and I see the daughter there. They were the prominent uh, business people in the community. There was the uh, uh, Keir Rorts, which was the Keir Go. Uh, Juanita, Juanita Carmichael, which was the Keir Go. They ran a business there. Uh, there was barbie shops, uh, and the canteen, was the best thing for us at the time, the Porter Center. Uh, we, we, we really had good times there. And the uh, people that lived on Montgomery Street, they had, uh, they had the best houses. In fact, some of them were there now. And when I get into the Merida Housing Authority, I explain that, how that worked out. But Baptist Town was a very interesting place for me when I was growing up. Uh, <clears throat> Back when the schools were segregated, we, uh, we used to walk down Cold Street, just like Cold Street is now, no different. We walked through the white community, just like walking through the black community. The streets, nothing changed from my age group to now. We had white neighbors back to back next doors, lived on the same street, so to speak. Uh, but I remember Tig's Grocery Store. Tig's Grocery Store, it was, it was Pink Prather before then, I don't know if anybody on them know that. But that was, the, that was the store that you could go and get bologna, you know, smoke links, you know, pig feet. <laughs> I mean, really. No, no beef for us. My brother's in the audience right there. No beef for us, you know. <laughs> so, but also there was credit, you know. 
you can go there and, 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 and he'll let you have credit. So that was pretty interesting and, and pretty important for us during that time. But going to school, uh, to Lemon Street, that was uh, a real, real, real good place because of the school teachers. I won't get too much into that. That's, that's going to pay on for itself in the future. But, but Lemon Street, uh, the, the, the teacher was very interested in us getting the education. Uh, I dropped out one time, and because I played sports very well, I was kind of hustled back into class. <laughs> Uh, whatever they had to make me come in, I came in and I was glad because I played football and that's how I went to Daniel Payne College uh, and Allen University. But Babbage Town was a wonderful place to live for me. It was hard, very hard, but I would go back to live in that place. There was one other place, and I'm going to close on that, on Babbage Town, there was one other place that was very interesting to us, and that was Joyland. I don't know if y'all remember that's here, that's old enough. Remember Joyland? Joyland is on the corner of Hunt Street and Pine Street where the fence where you got a lot of big homes back in there. But therefore they really uh, did the Baptist Town thing that's there now. And the White House that's on, I think the Blair's there on Cherokee Street. Mayor Blair was the mayor during the time, and I find out that we used that field because he rented it to the city. We didn't know that. But Lemon Street played football in that field. The people that worked for the, for the white people up in the area walked through the field by their house. No problem. This went on for years. So uh, Jordan was where we played most of the time in the community. Uh, so Baptist Town, the way Baptist Town is now, hadn't changed. You just got some bigger houses over that spot. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit more about um, the schools that you went to, Lemon Street Elementary, as well as the high school, and maybe if you could talk about uh, some special teachers that you had along the way. And, also, maybe some of your classmates. I, I know you graduated from high school in 1958. I think Walter Moon was in that class yes, with you. Yes, yes. And um, may, maybe you could talk about uh, um, some of those memories of classmates and teachers. And You've told us a few things, but maybe just go a little bit further about uh, the school and whether you thought you got a good education there and so on. I did get it. And, and, and this is funny, but it's not funny. But you know, <clears throat> we was poor. And, and, and at times, going to Lemon Street, I think I remember when I was in seventh grade. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, and uh, my mother, you know, I, I guess she got funds once a month. But there were some times that, that we didn't have food. And sometimes we didn't have breakfast. But I remember when I got in seventh grade, mostly of, of the hard time of recognizing uh, that was uh, pretty bad for me. Uh, I remember uh, personally sitting next to uh, one of the guys who brought lunch to school every day. And back in that time, 1950, when the, when the school was built that's there now, uh, Aaron Adams was the principal. And I would be so hungry. And I had headaches all the time. I had, had no idea why. But they didn't give free lunches during that time. Mm -hmm. And they would ask us to go into the lunchroom, to sit in the lunchroom, watching people eat, and we hungry. I mean, that was, that was trouble. So I found out that, you know, that was one of my problems of learning. So I had, I had a, very serious problem, <laughs> hard to learn because of the headache. Uh, study didn't make any difference. I used to stand in line in spelling class and I couldn't spell a lick. And this was separate when I started middle school. So I got smart. I went and got me a job <clears throat> catting at the country club. And that made a big difference because I would buy my food and lunches were heavy. 
And in that classroom, uh, there were uh, people that lived in the projects who, I mean, they had it made, you know. I mean, we did, in Baptist Town didn't have it made, but going to Lemon Street and what was there in elementary school was hard for me. But although the teachers was there and what they did, they made sure that we tried, make, make sure that they tried to get us to do what we supposed to do in reference to education and study, and I, I just couldn't do it. There, there's no way. So finally, when I got into high school, when I got into high school, uh, Mr. Ruff, Mr. Scott, Mr. McKay, uh, Mr. Jackson, and uh, Mr. Woods, Mr. Woods was first. Once Mr. Woods got a hold to you in classroom, you, you really had to do something because he'll take you to the class and paddle you. <laughs> but after I got into school, in, in high school, I realized that I had to study hard. But from the eighth grade to the 12th grade, I skipped class. I, I didn't get promoted in the eighth grade, I skipped to the, to the ninth, skipped to the 10th. When I got to 12th grade, they made me go back and take up classes to graduate. So I went back and got my car, and I saw where in the elementary school where I was promoted on trial. <laughs> From the third to the fourth on trial. And I recognized then that I, I, I was pretty bad, but after going to high school in 12th grade, Mr. Scott was one of the best teachers that I really had. He taught on a level where that you had to uh, write from the board. He wrote on the board and you come back and you write and he gave an examination. Because when I got to college, that helped me out quite a bit. And the 12th grade, I began to, you know, have some B's and C's. I had a couple of A's. <laughs> but uh, a few of the teachers that was good there was was Mrs. Ruby Williams, Mr. Jackson, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, uh, Mr. McKay, Mr. Ruff taught chemistry. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was uh, John James, John James. They were one of my favorite teachers because they helped me really get out of the, get into high school, get out of high school. Why did you call Mr. Woods Drip? <laughs> well, <laughs> where did you get that from? <laughs> uh, we call him Drip because he walked so soft. You never knew where he was. <laughs> and we used to cut class. And when we cut class, there's a branch back there, back of the school. And we slipped to the branch. When we get in the branch, we hear him coming. He run after us in the branch. Our shoes got wet, his didn't. He knew the wrong. <laughs> and we called him Drip because we never knew where he was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, he, was, he was a good principal. I know Lemon Street had a state championship later on. How good was your football team? Pretty good. I was on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, back in the day, you know, in the football team, there was uh, uh, there was Walter Moon played in, Ray McCluskey played in, a guy named William Watts lived in Smyrna. He played quarterback. I played halfback, and one of my brothers played halfback with me at the time, my brother me. And uh, <clears throat> we played schools, which were segregated schools: Cartersville, Rome, uh, Cedar Town. Uh, Decatur, uh, College Park, uh, Griffin, all those schools that we played during that time. Uh, we had we had winning seasons, but we never went to championship. This was this was from uh, 50, 50, 55 to 58. Well, I know after you graduated, you went to Allen University briefly, and uh, and then you. Uh, went to Daniel Payne Junior College in Birmingham.
Could you talk a little bit about why you went over there? And uh, later on, we're going to talk toward the end of the interview about your sit-in activities. But um, maybe could you talk a little bit about how your experience at Daniel Payne Junior College maybe started raising your consciousness about some of the um, social issues of the age? Well, I got a football scholarship to Alley University. And uh, the scholarship was given because the coaches were from Alley University. That was Mr. Ruff. Uh, Agit hadn't got there yet. Ben Wilkins came, but he was drafted into service, so he, he didn't have an opportunity to coach me. Uh, that was my senior year. Um, and uh, after I finished high school, I wanted to go to college so bad. Uh, I had no other way I didn't want to go to service. <laughs> so they gave me a scholarship to Allen University. And I went to Allen University, and we went in August, and they had a cut the first week in September, and I got cut. I didn't make it, I wasn't good enough, <laughs> I thought. So I knew someone on staff, and they said, listen, we have a, a sister college in Birmingham called Daniel Payne College. So you go down there, you know, and, and, and explain to me what happened. You do good, you come back. So I, I, I took off. And when I got to Birmingham, played first string halfback. Mm -hmm. I played first string halfback and also played defense. So that was my two year scholarship at Daniel Payne College. Mm -hmm. uh, and after Daniel Payne College, I went back to Allen University. Mm -hmm. And I decided not to play football at that time. So that's when I really got into, into my books, you know. Mm -hmm. And my finances was bad because I was on a football scholarship there at uh, Daniel Payne. And after I left Daniel Payne, that's when the student loan first started. I think the student loan started, government student loan started in 1950, uh, 1960, I believe. No, it was 1957. Mm -hmm. and, after I got to Alley, I didn't get on the student loan, but I did have a work scholarship there. Mm -hmm. And I worked there a year, not having the money to really go to next year. But Miss Hattie Wilson, my second, uh, second quarter in my third year up there, I didn't have monies to play to take, take the exam. Miss Hattie Wilson got up money from Marietta and sent and paid for tuition that second quarter. I mean, the second semester. Mm -hmm. So that's how I finished that in one year. Wow. So I came back home, and uh, I couldn't go back, didn't have the money. I got a job, worked at the hospital, and <clears throat> they built a recreation center. I think I'm asking some more questions. That's fine. Yes, please. Uh, and I uh, they built a recreation center, and uh, I, I, I majored in physical education. So. There was two applicants, Kenny Carter and myself. <laughs> Mr. Carter, he had a, he has a degree in PE. I didn't, I only went three years. But what happened is I knew more people than, <laughs> <laughs> than Mr. Carter. Although Mr. Carter's mother was, was pretty good, she was a you know, prestige woman in the community, but I looked more, looked more than, than he did or she did. So I talked to my aunt, and they, she talked to somebody else. Went to see Al Bishop. Al Bishop said, you got the job. <laughs> so I started working at the rec. And at that time, uh, working at the recreation center, I stayed in that building and maybe about six months without any equipment at all. <laughs> and uh, helped out at the swimming pool. But we did have softball uh, during the summer. So I, I did softball team to lay there. So going to uh, work for the Long Street Recreation Center was the beginning of my life. I'm talking about it really shaped me up real good. Back during that time, I could not read when I got that job. Because back during the time of seventh grade, headaches and all that, but when I went through high school, I knew how to get my way through, and I skipped myself because I didn't get promoted in high school. So when I got the job at Long Street, I was a little advanced in, 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 in uh, physical education, leaving Allen. 
So I just buckled down, buckled down, and I got myself together on, on how to do PE programs like I learned in that, but I still couldn't read that well. Mm -hmm. So after I got started, God blessed me to be able to learn how to read, learn how to calculate the whole bits of education that I get in high school. Mm -hmm. So I started running the rec, and that was, that was something beautiful there. I mean, I can't explain this. We have a recreation family. I, I would say the ones in the 60s, that's the Marietta that's living now, that's in the 60s, that's a family for me. Mm -hmm. And after I left the uh, uh, Lawrence Street Recreation Center, the reason I left Lawrence Street Recreation Center, I was had a uh, Little League baseball team, and I was looking for help for uniforms. And I went to the Marietta Housing Authority, and I talked with a manager named Nelson. He was a director. <coughs> so he said, I got a job for you. you. Are you interested? And he told me about the urban renewal program. I didn't know what was going on. I said, yeah. But I went and talked to Al Bishop and asked him, could I work part time and then work for the housing authority? He said, sure. So I went to work for the housing authority, urban renewal. They gave me similar manuals like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't read a little. <laughs> comprehending what I need to do. But before they opened the urban renewal, I studied, I studied one-on-one. -on -one. I studied myself where that I could really understand what I need to do to get this program through. So once they put me in the projects where I was working, which was on uh, uh, Hunt Street, we had an office trailer there. They gave me office. And I had an opportunity to, to, to pick my secretary. And I picked uh, Walter Moon's wife, Winthrop, and Martha Blunt, because she left Martha Blunt came in. But I studied so hard. And then it, I got relaxed. And I taught myself, with God's help, I taught myself how to read, how to calculate. And they gave me a, a million dollar budget to work for. And, and I did all of that. And today, well, what my experience is, is, is now that uh, I even had my tax business in the community one time. <laughs> uh, I, I got that good. Uh, but after working, working with the Urban Renewal, uh, I had an opportunity to, to relocate 123 families, and there were approximately 25 businesses in Baptist Town. Now, in Baptist Town, as well as Louisville and Lawrence Street, there was two projects. There was an urban new project <coughs> in Baptist Town, or R69, residential <coughs> and business, and the one here on Lawrence Street, which was business downtown. Mm -hmm. The government gave urban renewal back in the time, they gave, called a Uniform Relocation Act. <coughs> At the time, the homes was worth maybe $3,000, $4,000 that the people lived in, they owned them, paying to Medford. Mr. Medford was mostly the mortgage holder. Well, how could you be relocated for $3,000? Now, there was a Louisville urban renewal back before my time. I was in college then, I think. And I, I understand that was a very bad urban renewal because the money wasn't there, and the people was located, I guess, where they could. But this program, <coughs> was great. That urban renewal plan that they had for well, Louisville did not give them no displacement monies. The urban renewal that I, did, that I did, they gave, if you were a tenant, live with your parents, or live with your parents, and then own. Urban renewal gave $4,000 to the tenant to help he or she go out and find a place to live. And in some homes where you had, on Johnson Street, you had maybe three families or four families with kids living in one house. Well, it also gave the families the opportunity to get on their own because $4,000 was a lot of money back, back in those days. So they was able to get rental property on their own with, with their families. The homeowner, who maybe got three or $4,000, Herbert Renewal had a, a relocation plan where that if you needed a three 
three-bedroom house, four-bedroom house, there was a scale where you would get additional monies. A three-bedroom house, you could get additional $15,000 free money. A four-bedroom a four house, you could get nineteen five, if I remember right. So in Babbage Town now, where you see new homes, such as the Bennett home, you see a, the Bennett home, the red brick, uh, that's, that's a four-bedroom house. There was a, a, a three, I think they probably sold, bought for about $6,000. So they was able to get that home with less mortgage. Jane Street, Tower Road, all the brick homes up there, that's where a lot of homeowners were relocated. And those homeowners were relocated up there because of the revenue share, not revenue share, the Uniform Relocation Act, where they gave them up to that amount of money that I mentioned to go along with what they didn't have, which was just $3,000, which wasn't very much. So that was a very good relocation uh, uh, program for the city of Marietta. So uh, the businesses, which was about 25 black businesses, back in the days, black businesses were supported to one another, and we had put money in the community. We didn't have to really go out. We supported each other, as well as Lawrence Street. But what happened was, <clears throat> the businesses received monies, grants, based on their income tax. And they did file income tax. Mr. Hunter, he had a strip there. He had his business. He had, there were a, a grocery store, Mr. Weddington. There was a uh, uh, cap stand. One time they had a 10 cent store there. But anyway, those businesses received uh, monies to be relocated. Now, the housing authority is supposed to have had on the corner where the windows are located, where the uh, teller windows are located, ATM machines, and where the bank is located, that really is supposed to be neighborhood shopping for blacks during the time. And that was a plan that was approved by the federal government. Well, it never happened. Downtown Marietta businesses, which is on Lawrence Street, very good businesses there. I mean, been there for years. They got the same grant, but when we relocated them, they had no place to go. Mm -hmm. The only person that stayed in business was two people. That was Mr. Hunter, which was his son, Charlie Jr., mm -hmm. and Como Weddington. He relocated his business in Atlanta. In fact, it's still there, but I think he, he leased it out to somebody. Those are the only people I remember that really st stayed in the business. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened to the property that's supposed to be built for neighborhood shopping? Because there was a change of administration in, 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 in City Hall, uh, city manager by the name of Jack Crane. Jack Crane mm -hmm. and Hugh Grogan was in office at the same time. Jack Crane did not follow through on the urban renewal plan because when we closed out urban renewal, we turned everything over to the city. Jack Crane decided to move some of the old houses on the lower end of Pay Street, own a couple of lots over there in Baptist Town that we could have had new homes on, okay? And set on the property there on, on, on Montgomery Street for neighborhood shopping for years. That's what it, it never, the shopping center never would have been built. Never had been built because of that. Jack Crane held back. So there was no place where that the black business could go. So you wonder now, like, why there's no black business in Marietta? From my experience and what I had to deal with, this is why. The money was there, the potential people here was there, but because of the administration of the city at that time, which is, which is, which I think Jack Crane was in there. Yeah. And Hugh Grogan. He was, he became, uh, we're gonna get to Hugh now. Yeah. Hugh Grogan, <clears throat> Hugh Grogan, uh, he was four or five years older than I am. And uh, Hugh used to, uh, he lived in public housing and he taught swimming lessons. 
There was a song I used to hit him out. Well, when he graduated from school, <clears throat> he went to a college uh, in Atlanta, then he went to uh, New York for a doctorate, and he changed to something else. Mm -hmm. But Hugh Grogan was, has been in my life at that time for a long time. Even when he came back to visit, you know, he always had parties for the community. And when he, he uh, left New York and he came to stay, we worked together very closely. And it was so close that <clears throat> it was like, he, he had an office in my office in the Urban Renewal uh, uh, Department. But when he was running for city manager, I mean for the for council, Hugh Grogan had maybe five or six other people that worked with him. Walter Moon, uh, Walter Moon, uh, Harry Adams. Um, I can't think of another three of them now. Dover, Dover, Dover. Uh, Mr. Dover? Yeah. Dover, yeah, Mr. Dover. He was in Dover. In Dover. He, he was on Yeah. Part of, part of that case. Yeah, he, he worked with him. But Hugh Grogan had, had been in the community, you know, for years before he became uh, city council. Mm -hmm. So he, he had made a good headway for what he did over the years, right. you know. Um, I believe you were at the um, um, Recreation Center for 17 years, is yes. that correct? So from like 62 to somewhere in the 70s, yeah. late 70s. Yeah. Right. Um, was that, uh, was the Recreation Center uh, for all blacks when it first opened in 62 or was it always integrated? Or how that it, was, it was for all black, but let's, let's go back. Okay. Let's go back. Now, I, heard, I heard the mayor say, <laughs> publicly at the recreation that we have. He said, you know, he came down and we ran him out. No, he was, that was a joke, I think. <laughs> because Marietta, when it comes to black and white race, uh -huh. and, and reference of, of, of going to the community, or whatever, it was open to whites, too. Mm -hmm. It was open to whites. Uh -huh. And being open to whites, that means that they were free to come. Uh -huh. uh, all I can say is that there was no problem with the black and white issue during my time in Boston. Mm -hmm. And now other times I can recall. Right. So that uh, when you did the urban renewal, is that in the 70s now, that that, um, that Baptist Town re urban renewal of James Street develops, or is that still in the 60s? No, that was that was in the 70s. Okay. That was, that was in the 70s. I, I think I, I, was, I was in, uh, uh, I think I was, I'd gotten married yeah, that was the set. That was the set. Okay. And then, uh, uh, of course, you Grogan ran for city council in 73. And after that, um, um, uh, instituted that lawsuit against the city, uh, Grogan versus Hunter. Uh, were you involved with that at all? Or can, uh, what's your memories of that case and how it changed things in Marietta? Well, what he was doing during the time that he was, he was, he came to my office and I was having I couldn't, not, I could not be uh, open because I was a city employee, employee at the time. So what we did, we met in the community, Moon, uh, Harry Adams, uh, C. Green, Cornelius Green, that's the name I, I, I tried to think of a while ago. But we met in the communities and we made plans. Uh, the plan that he had had to do with the law, basically. I don't think he, 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 he knew he would win if he could get that number in his ward. And he had did enough study, enough research to find out if he had it, if he could get this thing done, he would win. But it was pretty close. It was pretty close. And the reason is, back during that time, uh, the politician who ran used to hire blacks to drive for them to pick up voters. And that was a going thing for years. In his case, it wasn't so. It was just go to go to the poll. And I think he almost lost because some of the people were paid to tell the people to vote the other way. Mm -hmm. That did happen. Mm -hmm. I think it happened the second time when he ran the second time. That's why he lost the second time mm -hmm. because of that thing. Mm -hmm. So Hugh Grogan. 
was one of the best councilmen to me in my experience with City of Marietta. There was. Uh, because of the way the City of Mary is now, the bus system that we have now is because of Dean Brody. The uh, Uniform Relocation Act, I think it was the, the, the CD funds. Mm -hmm. I have some information what people had did behind the closed doors with HUD. That's the reason why the city is getting money now, because he laid the foundation to make mm -hmm. sure that money was, was has gotten and put in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to talk about some of the other community leaders and uh, your memories of people like Reverend Waterman and uh, George Miller and uh, Clary Jenkins and some others that uh, uh, you had mentioned earlier on, um, uh, Johnny Banks and Frank Sexton, yeah. Aaron Cuthbert. Can yeah. you talk about some of them? Yeah, I, I, I could put all of them in, in, in one hat. Because when I talk about one, it means uh -huh. for the other. Because what happened is, the reason the community was so good, the race relation, is because of these individuals. See, uh, you take uh, Aaron Cusper. Aaron Cusper, he worked for uh, Anderson Chevrolet. And he knew white people, okay? So if we need anything, we told Aaron Cusper. <laughs> if Aaron Cusper want to place you somewhere, he'll be out. Eric Cusper would be the man to do that. He also was on the Civil Service Board. I think my brother, one of the first, were you the first black for the Sorry, fire department? For, for the fire department. <coughs> no. mm -hmm. But Eric Cusper was <laughs> on, the, on the board at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you take George Miller. George Miller, he had his own band. He played uh, 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 bass guitar. Yeah, bass drum, not bass guitar. Mm -hmm. Bass drum. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, bass guitar, the fiddle. one that the strings? Fiddle. Fiddle, the fiddle. fiddle. Well, he played that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he played for dances all over Marietta for the, for the wealthy people. Mm -hmm. He also played at the Dobbins Air Force Base once a week. Really? And, and he was the manager of the first Jack the Robinson Little League, the only one, in fact. Jack the Robinson Little League, does anybody remember that or heard about that? Uh, and this was under uh, Mrs. Dorsey, who ran uh, public housing. Yeah. And if you ever seen any baseball pictures, mm -hmm. this is where you had uh, my age group, Walter Moon, and so a lot of them. If you ever see the pictures, there's a whole lot of names that I, I could call, but I can't remember right now. But Walter Moon, with his long legs <laughs> and with his smart self, he was a genius in high school. <laughs> you asked me about him. Mm -hmm. He was a genius in high school. Uh, he played basketball. He played football. And uh, when he got out of school, when he, when he leave practice, go straight home. You didn't see him anymore because his mother had him to play. I mean, to stay. <laughs> Plus, his stepdaddy was Aaron Adams. You all remember Mr. Adams, principal, uh, principal, mm -hmm. principal. And Mr. Adams was his stepfather. Okay, so Walter just studied all the time. <laughs> so when Walter, when Walter went to service, he came back post office, and you he wound up being what the first black, first black postmaster in Stone Mountain, and he went on to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. so, and Walter was just a genius, but he was undercover, so to speak, and working with the community to help out. Yeah. Uh, George, going back to George Miller, George Miller was. Uh, he was instrumental in getting jobs as well. There was a black security uh, company. They wore green, green uniforms. Mr. Miller organized that. We used to see those guys at the football game. I don't know if you all remember now, the Lemon Street football games when they were winning. You saw, you saw guys in, in the little green uniforms. That was George Miller's hmm. game. But he was instrumental because he, he, he helped us out as children and Jack Robinson Little uh, mm -hmm. baseball game. Uh, Frank Sexton, Frank Sexton, he was a political guy, as well as Aaron Cusper. They played their role in City Hall with the mayor. That's their association with, with the mayors. And, and also legislative folks downtown, yeah. uh, that's Marietta. 
So they claimed them because they waited tables. So anything we needed in the community, as well as whatever, they were the one that did it for us. So we had a good relationship with them. Mm -hmm. You didn't have Winston Strickland on your list, but I think of him in terms of political clout. Uh, what's your memories of him? Well, well Strick was from, he was from Carson. Uh, Strick came here as a barber. He, he, was, he was done on a background at Brock Service Station. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he and Walter Moon built the shop we call Street's Place. Yeah. But he was from Cartersville. And uh, if you wonder why he was so great here in Cartersville, I mean here, not in Cartersville, it goes back to what Jesus said, that prophet's not welcome in this place. <laughs> 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 but he came here and done, he done right. great because he was in politics. <laughs> Well, we put it off for a long time, and uh, there's something that you pretty much kept a secret for a number of years, I think. I wonder if we could start talking about that now. Yeah, we can. Okay, well, uh, 1960, I guess it was, you were over in Birmingham and uh, encountered uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and uh, I guess Reverend Charles Phillips and some yeah. folks like that. Can, can you talk a little bit about how your consciousness got raised and you got involved in the sit-in movement that really almost the very beginning of the sit-in movement in America. Yeah, I, you mind if I stand on this? It's sure. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is a touchy situation in reference to me, but I've, I've grown a little bit now. This happened 40 years ago. 40 years ago. More than 40. Is it 40, 60? <laughs> 40, 60 years ago. 60 years ago. <laughs> you, you made me think young. <laughs> Listen, back, back to, in, during the time I was at Daddy Green College, I was a pretty tough guy there. I was a good football player. And uh, I was on under roll there too the first first year. Uh, and the, the guys that uh, was in school with me for the most a lot of them lived uh, off campus, but those that live on campus, we had one done for the boys and one got done for the girls. And uh, I didn't know what was happening in Birmingham. In fact, during the time of ML King's march, I was uh, against Segregation. That's all I knew because I was satisfied with Marietta. I didn't know what was going on. Believe it or not, I did not know. All I know is that Elmer King was marching in, in the bus, you know, down, you know, down in Rosa Park. That's all I knew. So I was like some other blacks that I found out that why you wanna why you wanna you know go with white people? Aren't you satisfied? You know, I was like that. Because he and Marietta <coughs> There was no race problem here. And if some of you from Marietta think about it, there was segregation, but there was no race. Segregation was set apart, you know? Public, you didn't see no, no race going on, uh, race problem going on. So, although there was uh, separate water fountains, but they were so close together, I don't remember seeing a black and white sign. All I know is I went in the clubs and drank water and run out the back door. <laughs> Um, because I knew it was a law. <laughs> I knew what would happen. So I, I wasn't used to the segregation that, that I experienced when I went to Birmingham. And I was transferred over there because of a scholarship, you know, to stay in school. My senior year there at, at the junior college, one of the roommates asked me to go with him one night. So they've been going downtown uh, to meet in reference to uh, a city, and I didn't know what he talking about. Okay, I go. So I went the first night. <clears throat> I went down and I heard what Shellworth was talking about. And what he was doing at the time, I was I was at that was the last meeting before they go the next two days to sit in. So they was training, you know, what to do, what not to do. And it was training about what time they supposed to sit down. And and one thing what the plan was that everybody had to sit down at the same time. Ten o'clock. And the reason for that, you hear later, but you sit down at 10 o'clock. 
So I went back to campus and uh, one of my roommates who invited me uh, explained to me the other two meetings that I wasn't there, what was going on. I said, okay, I'm, I'm still in. So we dressed shop, went on downtown, <clears throat> and uh, I said in uh, Loveland's, there was 10 of us, I said in Loveland's with a guy named uh, James Davis, a preacher's son. I, I stuck with him for good reason. Uh, so <clears throat> going into Loveland for the first time, there in the back of it, there was uh, salon and there was restaurants. And in the restaurant, they had black, black uh, waitresses. And as we come up the steps, one of the waitresses says, say, here y'all come again. Uh, in other words, she went for it, you know. So we sat down, and when we sat down, that 10 o'clock was very important to us. Everybody sat down at 10, and we, we timed it just right. The reason we had to sit down at 10 is because there was a telephone call was supposed to be made to the police department that there was a sit down demonstration in these restaurants. The reason that was a precaution reason for our safety. Birmingham was a rough, bad place. Before I got over there, Shellerworth was already, the house had been bombed. He almost got killed trying to integrate one of the high schools and with his, with his children. And definitely they knew that he would be behind something like this, but they couldn't put their hands on him. So once we set out at 10 o'clock, uh, we was hoping that they would call the police because we saw coming up the steps, people coming after us. And we just sit there, everybody else left. So we, at, once we sit there for a while, these people was coming up the steps and what, who was behind them was the police department. So the telephone call worked. Mm -hmm. If not, no telling what could have happened mm -hmm. because the way Birmingham was is they, they, they didn't care. They, I mean, they're just, I mean, they, they would hurt us. You can imagine. Mm -hmm. So once we were arrested, well, they took us outside. They throw us in any car that passed by. They took the guy, throw me in, another guy in, took us over. So the 10 of us stayed in jail almost two weeks. Almost two weeks. They were nice to us, but I was interviewed, looked different than the rest of them. I don't know why. I have no idea why I was different. But what always got me was that in the courtroom, they was putting more emphasis on Shuttleworth than on what we did. Like I said, it was after Shuttleworth. Uh, the question was, how did y'all get there? Who persuaded y'all? And if you read the case where they found us guilty, they was trying to say that Shuttleworth forced us to do the sit-down demonstration. If that was the case, then Shuttleworth would have probably spent more time than we would have. Now, the sit-down demonstration then wasn't anything. They want to get Shuttleworth out of it, just like they was after ML King. But the question was, did Shuttleworth persuade us to sit down? And the question was, yes, he did, because we met at his house. And if you read the report, my case went to the Supreme Court, okay? And the Supreme Court, they kicked it out. And it was just a fact that the Birmingham law <coughs> was a law that was all over the land, meaning that they changed audiences. Change audiences is like, if the city of Marietta want to make a law change to benefit them or the race, they change it. And that's what happened to slavery. It would have been just a misdemeanor if you had gotten arrested a crime, <coughs> okay, you spend a few days in jail. But what the danger was that the civil rights movement, why it was so peaceful and had to be peaceful, is because of the law. That's what protected us. If we had to raise our hand to defend ourselves, then we would have broke the law, and then we would have been sued. <coughs> okay? But since that didn't happen, then they had no case with us or Shuttleworth. So it went to the Supreme Court. 
on those bases. But before uh, uh, I left high school, I mean, before I left college, we was on campus, and we had to stay, I guess, pretty, pretty close <coughs> because of the clans. The clans did come to the campus at one time, and the barn burned across, across the street. But we wasn't afraid at that time because we had experienced the real fear of sitting down in those stores. Birmingham was a dangerous place. I'm talking about it was tough. And Marietta, black, when you hear me talk about me going across the line to see where the real tough stuff was, that, that was Alabama. I came out of a good place compared to, <coughs> to Birmingham. In Birmingham, some of the people that have been there for years don't even talk about grace, even now. They do not talk about nothing in reference to, if, if they end up, I say if they're in the 70s, they don't talk about no race because they had been in that bondage for years. I, I, I remember when the, when, the, uh, when the church was born. Once that church was bombed and the people died, the people, the people in the community never would respond to nothing in reference to that bomb because they still were afraid. Now, I don't know about now, how it is over there now, but I know the 70 year old people do not talk about Birmingham. It was just that bad. In my experience, in the, in the uh, uh, sit down demonstration, Never, I never talked about it because I take it very serious. My life is on the line. There are events that happen here in, 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 in Marietta, in NAACP events. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't attend them because that's serious to me. I mean, it's good to have, you know, the events, but, but, but what about the main factors that's involved? Some of our young people do not even know anything about MLK now. They don't know anything about nothing about, about the civil rights movement. But as it is now, uh, everything is breaking clean. Everything is understanding based on how it is now with MLK, but they never had the experience and know what it was about. So Birmingham movement that I was in, I thank God, he put me there like he got me here. I've, I've seen a lot. I've been involved in a lot. I've talked about my education, what I, when I couldn't read, couldn't count. And I've talked about positions I had, administration, having a tax business. I even sued the Merida Housing Authority to try to save Ford Hill. I wrote the lawsuit myself. <laughs> and I, I got good to give God the praises for Everything that I've done, and I thank God, even now, because if it weren't for him, where will I be? <clears throat> thank you, friend. <laughs> Amy, do we have time to let the audience ask questions? Sure. Are there any questions that any of y'all would like to ask? Hill, I know you oh. Is and has done it 
black folks don't make it. They not in there. <laughs> so, so, so they can't afford those three hundred thousand dollar houses in Louisville. Uh, three hundred thousand dollars in Dallas Town. Uh, on the other side of the country club. Uh, all these walking distances of downtown area, black folks don't live in these. You got a few here and there, but they working on them. They working on Shepherd Street town for both ends. So when they get rid of that, it won't be no black folks in the inner city. This is in my lifetime. I've seen it all disappear. And I mean, it seems like a snowball that we can't stop. Uh, no one wants to get up there and get ran over with it. And my people, my age, we, we, we've exhausted all our energies now. What little time we got left, we need it for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I, I see it, I would like to do something, but that's, I can't do a thing about it. Do you want to respond? Well, he, he's, he's right. He, he, was, he experienced the Louisville uh, urban renewal. Mm -hmm. and that's what he voiced it. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, he, what he's saying about uh, the housing is correct. As I told you, you know, when they got rid of the businesses, there's no place to go. Mm -hmm. And see what happened in the city of Marietta. And I might get an amen from young man I see behind him here. Marietta didn't have <coughs> Didn't have a tax. He didn't. He, Marietta didn't have a, 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 a tax that place. If I'm saying that right, because public housing was in every area of the city limits, and they, there was no taxes coming in. So they got rid of the public housing, and that's what you got in sight. You got four to five hundred thousand dollar houses. When I did the urban renewal, not when I, not the urban renewal. When I did, when I filed the suit against the Maryland Housing Authority not to tear down Ford Hill, and it's documented. The reason I did that, because Ford Hill was historical. It was built in, 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 in what, what was it, 41. 41, okay? And I have documentation, even from Washington Historical Preservation, that the procedure that they went through wasn't right. This is probably history, after I gave an identification of what they didn't do, but what happened was that they needed some taxes. So they illegally towed down on Fort Hill. Now, I, I had, I think, seven, eight years to, to refile the case. And to save Fort Hill at least would have been an advantage because they towed down the rest of them, I think. But that is what happened to Fort Hill, I mean, to Marietta. They needed tax money. Uh, Smyrna was out running Marietta. So this is why you got those homes in those community, communities. But what's happening in the rest of the community here is that the people who own the homes, the owners die. They leave it to the children, talking about the black, and they sell it. That's what's happening. Right where I was raised, right across the street. Father died. Six months later, the children sold it. For 100 plus, the house on the market for 265, mm -hmm. one up the street for three, 300 something, and they sold it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have that kind of money, they say. But we don't want to move back into the community. That's one of our problems. Mm -hmm. See, we, won't, we, won't, we got to think about this. We, we like to move out. Okay, but the city of Marietta is building houses like over for the Boston homeless, which is comfort and price. But to answer his question in reference to why there isn't, is because there's no land. They, they've taken the land. Mm -hmm. So there's no site in the city of Marietta that you can get, you know, uh, mm -hmm. houses that can be affordable. That's my, my thought. Mm -hmm. I think there was a hand over here a while ago. Michael. Hey, how you doing, know, sir? How you do, sir? Good. My question is, uh, what vision do you have for the future for our people here in Marietta? Is there something that that's on the table that you would love to see before uh, that we can come back or we can be recognized. Because me, myself, I'm part of Louisville. And if I bring my grandkids, my house is still standing. I grew up on Grandma.
So I was wondering, is there a vision that you have that, uh, that future Marietta, what would that be? <clears throat> be already with you, and I just mentioned there is no land, okay? But it comes down to, to mortgages, financing. HUD has all kind of finances. For, even if you got bad credit now, they got money there that you have to own on. But there's no land. So what you do with what's here now? We can't tell a inherited person not to sell their home. The same thing happened with Jane Street. Up there at Jane Street, you got, uh, I would say, 45% of blacks left on Jane Street because of family dying and they, they selling the property. You can't stop that. But what we can do is preserve black history. And this is what the temple is now. And I said this before, black history is very important if you think about it. We can't build, but where can you carry your grandchild to the community that you live in and see something that you could tell them about your lifetime? There's nothing that's there, but that you can read, but there is something there that could be presented and to stay where it could be like black history. Now you take Louisville, for instance. How many of you know that that park, that land, was given to the city of Mary by a black woman? By a black woman. Now, the experience is because of the houses over there now, and I had experience with them last year. They had a homecoming over there. And the city of Marietta guidelines is prohibiting a mass number of people to assemble. It, the, the, the rule don't read, read that way, but there is a hesitation because they had experienced that. And I was there and, and we were working on it. But see, if, if that stopped, then that's, and that's history for us. A black woman give the park to the city of Marietta and the city of Marietta said, you can't have a reunion over here, you know, bring people back home to celebrate. Mm -hmm. That's where they are today. That's where they are today. So we're working on that. Same way with Lemon Street. They're rebuilding Lemon Street, a replica Lemon Street High School. Okay? Now, that's our community. Thank God that they are going to build it back. They, they the ones suggested this and we agreed. But if we don't take part in letting them know that we are interested, this is, this is gonna be a school now with what they want. So I'm hoping I'm asking you a question. We have to get involved in preserving history of where we was. We can't build back. Uh, one in the back and then one in front. Um, thank you so much for being here and thank you for serving in the community. My brother was the vice leader out of Pennsylvania. My question is more about the field. Right? So I teach young girls at risk and I had a conversation with them and they had no idea what the March on Washington was and the program was. So my question is how do we bridge the gap with our children without like this one, I'm, I'm fortunate to watch out on the track, but it's so, dis it's so disconnected from where you are now. How do we bridge the gap and help them to understand, you know, what you went through, what I went through, because they all, how do we help them understand how important um, where we came from is and understand the path we got them to some of the level of comfort that they had there, or even discomfort? How do we bridge the gap with children? How do we teach them? Well, my experience, just working with, with young people, and, and I have grandkids, which, which are limited of what I've done, okay? But where I see the problem was, they had up in, I think she mentioned, uh, Amy mentioned up in uh, 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 last Monday week ago, here these kids uh, with the ages of 12, 17, something like that. And what I found out that there are not enough adults that has gone through that period 
of segregation to desegregation is not enough because you've got young parents who don't have that experience. So how do you get it? They can't get it at school. Now we have a granddaughter that's in Kennesaw, and she, what she tells me about black history is what black history is today, so to speak, not back during the past. If you talk to someone that's in their 50s now about M.L. King, they quote what M.L. King said. They don't really know what the struggle was personally. So to bridge the gap, this is where I think that the churches and communities, neighborhood, have to come up with some type of gathering with the experiences like Amy doing at the museum to bring in people to explain what it was and how they have to cope with it. I hope, I hope I'm getting some information to you that the suggestion. Now there was one guy that I interviewed, Amy, I think he was about maybe 12. All he heard was the N-word. N-word. They don't hear the whole word now. All they know is N-word because the whole word is not allowed to be spoken nowhere. So here this young guy never heard the whole word, just the N-word. Come on now, but that's what's happening. So how do you do that? You have to be real with them. And real is that my wife and I, we had the experience of telling them how it was. And it seemed like it worked in some respect. I think that one other person right here. Uh, Mr. Gover, I'm a transplant. Yes, ma'am. And I want to thank you very much for all that you did. I'm very well aware thank you, of the struggle. I'm very, very well aware of it, even though I was up, way up, way up there somewhere. Yes, ma'am. But I'm one of you all now. <laughs> and I'm interested in what's going on down here in Marietta because yes. I live, go to church here. My church is here. Even though I live in Kennesaw, I heard you say your granddaughter's in Kennesaw. But I'm very thankful for the information. I'm very thankful for the association that I'm receiving down here from Marietta people in the surrounding areas. And I'll tell you, I hope you're not still hurting because I know you really went through it. And I thank you very much for it. Thank you, man. Yeah. That's my son right there. <laughs> I don't know. Let me go to somebody. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to say that um, basically, I, this is the first time I've been in this area in decades. Same to say, I just came down this street. I was like, man, what happened to Baptist Town? What happened down in the Old Little Bus Circle? I, growing up here as a teenager, I actually grew up in North Cobb near Gregory High School. And family is here. So summertime we rode our bikes, going on my aunts, uncles, and so forth and so on house. And I just remember even driving on those bus, those bus circles, you couldn't drive them, <laughs> not getting pulled over, you know. But um, the thing that I have to say, and I guess a comment I have to say is um, thank you for how you raised us. Um, you know, we were both in a white area, Sprayberry High School was 5,000 plus, maybe 820 black. But yet still, it was, I got brought to the sitting area playing basketball in Louisville. Um, I remember softball. I remember you bringing the spray rate kids down to play softball, <coughs> playing basketball at Florence Street Recreation Center, things like that. And how it, it, it's, it changed things that I saw in my mind as a young, young black kid. Um, but as far as, as I hear that, how things are changing as far as housing in, in this area, and I think it's more a generation thing, black or white, and shame to say again, my generation, that we don't value anything that our family history has done, black or white. You know, I don't care, oh, we received, we, oh, our, I own this house now that my great grandmother had, whatever, I'm a seller. You know, whatever it is, you know, or my, my, my father had this business, and this generation is like, okay, you know what, I don't want to deal with it. I just take the money. Yeah. It's a cheap way out. Then we forget the history behind it. We forget yeah. the struggle, what the parents and 
grandparents did to get that business. We just want the money to go out and live elsewhere. Again, I'm part of that generation. I'm ashamed to say, ashamed to say that I have not been in the city of Marietta for I stay in Atlanta all the time now. So um, it's just to see everything here, bring my memories as I was telling her, I was like, man, that's where I got my hair cut up here. Street. <laughs> We're driving down, I was like, oh man, what happened to, but you know, the housing. So I, like I said, this is the first time I've been in this area probably over 15 years. But uh, I want to say thank you, Pop, for, uh, yeah. for everything that you've done. <laughs> Yes. yes. You have to change that. Yes. You got to get, get the information in the textbook. So that's just yes. one way that the uh, gap can be bridged yes. through education. Yes. Uh, again, our brother Pete. I just wanted to uh, bring up the education that I didn't hear you mention about Marietta through Lemon Street High School. Lemon Street High School was the school for all the close cities around here, oh, all yeah. the way up to Kennesaw yeah. and Ackworth, and uh, you're building another replica, but I don't know if you're going to check with the people from all these other smaller cities that spent four years coming yeah. back and forth down here. Yeah. You know, that's the history of all the our schools, is yeah. that it was a school for Smyrna and and Ackworth and yeah. all of those other areas. And uh, those that lived around Sprayberry, all of that. Yeah, that's way. right. Oh, so, Liberty Hill, li 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 yeah. So it's it's more than our school. It's more than just Marietta School. Yeah. But what I did, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Mr. Barrett, he's from uh, Kennesaw College. He was having the program of the museum. And he's interviewing on referrals and records of building that museum where pictures uh, who's who. And I met with him personally and also going to meetings. And to answer your question, uh, I did say in one of those meetings that I'm hoping that we will write a true history of Lemon Street, not a history of what you think. Now, what I mean by that is there's a limitation has been given to Kennesaw on doing this program. It's not Kennesaw's fault, okay? And my statement was to the group is that we have to write our own history. And what has happened even as of now is that don't, too many people know that. I think I mentioned Parker Hill. 
two minutes ago. Now he's all around Marietta, and he don't know what's going on. So what I'm doing personally, I knew that these cities went to Lemon Street. So I made contact, Mr. Berry, to some of those places for you to interview. And, and I'll get with you on that. I, you know. But to answer your question, personally, I'm doing that. Now, there is different class groups that's in here making referrals. And what I find out, the class group that was making referrals, they was in the 60s. It was in the 60s. I, I was in the 50s. So they couldn't tell my story. And I can't tell their story. And that was missing. That's what they been missing. You see? So what he just asked, I'm doing that. In fact, he needs to be interviewed. <laughs> um, he finished. He finished Lemon Street. <laughs> uh, uh, James Newberry, why don't you stand up? And, uh, Not there. How are y'all? And if you, you want to, if you want to make sure we get it right, talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> Did I ask you a question, Michael? Oh yes. Oh yes. There's okay. a question up at the very top, right there. Yes, ma'am. My experience in the last two years in working with uh, uh, Amy and the group, first time I've really been exposed in public, like I said, I, I, I didn't tell my story to anybody personally in Marietta. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that the information about race in Marietta has not been mentioned because there were no experiences. That's one problem. When it comes down to ML King and what ML King did, I have never heard no one in Marietta bring up the subject about ML King movement. And the reason is, is because we in Marietta didn't have a racial problem. Because we live next door. You know, we, we you know, our parents raised these, and we didn't have that experience. So my experience, I'm, getting, I'm gonna get to the current, but I'm trying to get to where you can follow my letter. When I went to Birmingham, it was a whole different story, okay? When I come back home, I had my kids. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't teach my kids nothing about ML King. I didn't even tell them about my experience. But what I did teach them was the fact that who they were, who they were to who, who they are and who they were to be. And when it comes down to experience them with race, they was they was experienced with race that I was. So how would I tell them now, my grandkids, how would I tell them about ML King? How would I tell them about James Gold experience? We won't be able to do that anymore. What we have to do as adults now is to experience with them our lives based upon loving one another and tell the story of the struggle and why we exist. But when it come down to classrooms about the movement of ML King, you're not gonna get it. If you, if, if you were to talk with me about my experience, 
I don't think I could tell you really how I felt or what happened. But what I can tell you is how to be a better person in understanding race, race relationship rather than tell you the story. The story is never going to be told right. But M.L. King struggled if you read it. Now, I run this book. This is your book, I want you to read. This is from me. This is, this is, I found this online. It says, M.L. King's Junior Research and Education Institute. Sit in. This is all about Birmingham, Alabama. There was some 1800s. Also, M.L. King's information is in here. And when I started reading this, and I find out all that took place in Birmingham and the suffering in Birmingham that the blacks took, I mean, from, from hanging to, you know, the burning. But what I also see in here is, is churches, white and black, working together. Now, should we tell our younger people of the struggle, or should we tell our younger people of the success because of the struggle? That's where we ought to look at it. From success of the struggle, I think they can see the, see the picture. Because the young people now do not want to hear about the struggle. Because they say, that's not going to be me. If you talk to a young black guy who is 23 or 24, I'm not going to let that happen to me. They don't want to hear it. But if, if, if you explain to them why they exist today, why they live, why they got the job, why they can do what they want to do, because of the struggle, I think the print will go. That's my suggestion. I hope I, I asked your question. Anybody else? Amy, you want to take over then? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming.